This is our first Grandparents' Rights Association of Oklahoma meeting. I think most of you know what I have to say, so I'm going to turn you over to Mike Workman. We are very happy that he's here to speak with us. Just wanted to get this flyer in here, sort of for benchmark. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Mike Workman of Tulsa, I'm a grandparent and a great grandparent, and I've been politically active for a long time since 1973, to be in the interest of full disclosure and to be accurate and all. Uh, I've worked with uh, the political process and the electoral process, and they are they're interconnected. Uh, and was asked to talk today about the legislative process and kind of as someone who's observed what Will Rogers called the uh, unusual process of watching sausages or laws being made, and he intentionally used the comparison because sometimes it's not pretty. But I, I wanted to use, to kind of give you two frames of reference. Uh, one is you've probably seen this delightful little animated cartoon of a bill literally a piece of paper wrapped up. It said, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. And it's a very popular tune through uh, fourth grade social studies and it's used in junior high school uh, government and, and high school government classes and all. And it's a delightful little song, but it basically just kind of gives you the basics of what happens from the time an idea is created to a law is put, put into place. I want to give you a different frame of reference, however. I want to give you the frame of reference, and you forgive me as a guy using a sports metaphor, but I want to give you a comparison of a baseball game. Uh, in, in politics, one of my ongoing metaphors is to explain to people that uh, baseball is very numbers-driven and very rule-driven. Everyone seems to know what the rules are to how to play baseball. But for some reason, some people can play baseball better than others. Now, even as a teenager, I had a baseball collection, and I was a numbers guy, so I knew a lot of the numbers and the, the odds and all. And, and I knew what odds, you know, what sort of pitchers and batters work together, which ones for the benefit of one side or the other and all. But just because you know the rules or the process of how something happens doesn't mean you can necessarily play the game on the professional level, or as in baseball, they call it the bigs, the big leagues. I use that comparison at all because if you could imagine, just because you understand the process, if you put a little league field on the, a little league team on the baseball field, and you put a professional baseball team on the field, it doesn't matter who understands the rules better, it's who uses the rules the best to their advantage. This is primarily a, an address here for a live presentation, but it's also a recording, and I'm going to try to speak, even though I'm in Oklahoma, I'm going to speak in generic terms so that what I say, and I've worked in legislatures in more than one state, so the comments I make will apply not just within the state of Oklahoma, but would apply in other states as well as far as I know. Hello, John Pop Pop Schaefer, who joined us now. <laughs> So it is working here and it's, it's showing things popping up. Uh, we do have an opportunity also to ask questions. So there's another person monitoring this from a separate machine. So if you have any questions, I think it gives you an opportunity to put a, a question in as you go. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes if there's questions. If not, I'm just going to kind of go into more details in what's going on there. Uh, as I said, um, I'm a grandparent and a great-grandparent and I've worked a lot in, in when I make political speech as part of my stump speech and is to say that at some point someone's thinking and they're just too polite to say, oh, no, you can't possibly be old enough to be a great grandparent. But I am. Uh, I have a great grandson who was born in Tulsa, going to turn five years old later this month, and a 13-month-old great granddaughter born down in Oklahoma City. Uh, I always joke with the, the granddaughter, who I was also a foster parent to, that she owes us one more great-grandchild because we were her foster parents for three years, and 
we expect payment for those three years to be three great-grandchildren and all. Uh, but in the process, uh, my gal Christine had a different type of story and all that uh, when her daughter, her only child, and the parent of her granddaughter split up, she had to go be here in Oklahoma and file a separate lawsuit and have separate legal representation not because she was worried about, but she wanted to make sure she was guaranteed access to her only granddaughter here in Oklahoma. She did that as a precaution, not because she had to, because she, she just wanted to play it safe. But this is the sort of experience that some people have found because the laws are not necessarily what people think they are sometimes, and every state can and does have its own set of laws. And I think the primary concern here that most people have under grandparents' rights is access to their grandchildren. I mean, you wouldn't be a grandparent if you didn't have grandchildren, but I think the most obvious question here is what are the legal rights of a grandparent to have visitation with their own grandchildren? And the reality is in every state, it's different. Now in Oklahoma, it's kind of put into two separate categories. Uh, and I need to use one category and all because it has its own set of laws and rules and regulations, and that is if the child is in custody at the Department of Human Services. And that's not at all unusual uh, when these conflicts arise. If a child is in D DHS custody, Department of Human Service custody and all, uh, they oversee not just the access of the parents of that child, but all other family members, including grandparents. Now, I've experienced this as a foster parent, and I'm also experiencing this now as a grandfather and a, as a great-grandfather with children and all. So in states where children are in official custody and all, there's a whole set of rules and regulations about how you can visit with them, what the conditions are, the amount of time, who has to be present, who can be present, who cannot be present and all. But these are very strict and very finite, and every state has some sort of similar process where they regulate these. Now, I use this as an example because no matter what state you're in, you probably need to be aware of what the regulations are for grandparent access to their own grandchildren if the child is in state custody. Because those regulations can pretty much be paralleled within the laws of your state, and if they're not, you might want to ask that they be paralleled or at least used as a model. Uh, and it's probably a good model to use because these are already in place in your state. The biggest hurdle to change is the old thing, and everyone's heard it said before, well, you know, we've never done it that way before. It's, it's not easy to make a change in the law. It's a whole lot easier for it just to stay the same. There's an old joke that there's about a thousand different ways to change the law and only one way to not change the law, and that's just don't do anything. So there's about a thousand different ways to approach it, and just because you learn this in high school government or even coll collegiate government classes and all, I'm just going to go through the basics. But again, what the rules are and how the game is played are sometimes two different aspects of the same phenomenon. Again, Use the thought of a baseball team and imagine just because you know the rules, if you're a little league team playing a professional baseball team, just because you know the rules and both teams know the rules doesn't mean one team's going to win because they know the rules better. It's because they use the same rules, they use the same rules better. Now in 49 of the 50 states, we have a two-body uh, legislature. In Nebraska, there's a unicameral legislature. They don't have a Senate and a House, uh, but all the other 49 states have what we call a lower house, or the House of Representatives, and an upper house, uh, a state Senate. Now, in some states, the names are different, like in Virginia, the House of Burgesses, uh, or House of Delegates in some states and all, but basically, uh, the term House and Senate are pretty much generic in 49 of the 50 states and it's safe to use the term lower house, which is usually because the House of Representatives are larger and the terms are usually shorter. In Oklahoma, it's two-year terms with 101 members. Uh, and all 101 members are up for election every two years. In Oklahoma, the state Senate, half it's a four-year term, and half of the seats are up every time. It's currently the year 2016, 
and 26 of the, which is half of the state Senate seats in Oklahoma, are subject to election. Now, every seat is not contested in a general election, but of the 26 state Senate seats, the Democrats filed in 20 of the 26 seats. Uh, so there's a lot of more contested races in Oklahoma than there have been in the past. Of the 101 seats in the Oklahoma House, 83 of the seats are subject to election uh, in November 8th. 2016. It's the largest number of contested seats we've had in Oklahoma in over 20 years, and that may or may not have a different dynamic. Uh, again, it's always unknown what will happen. Every law starts with an idea, and the idea I pitched out is to better delineate and codify in law what exactly is the right of a grandparent to visitation to their own grandchild. A uh, message popped up, uh, Charlotte, you might want to see if you can read it on the side. It's only popped up for a minute for me. <laughs> it says we're all over the moon in South Carolina. <laughs> Hello, South Carolina. Aren't we glad we, we made it generic rather than just Oklahoma specific? But again, uh, the original idea that I'm using for the purpose of this discussion is what are the legal rights in Oklahoma or your state for a grandparent to have physical visitation rights with their own grandchild? Uh, again, grandchild is defined usually not just by blood, but by relationship. Like, for example, I was foster parent to my gal Christine's only daughter's only daughter. There's no blood relationship, but as her foster father, I, I, it was more fun to be a grandparent than was a foster father and all. But legally, I can claim to be both her father and her grandfather because of that foster father relationship. But I promise you, being a grandparent is more fun than being a foster parent. So I quickly, when we got her from 15 to 18, we reverted back to being grandparents because it's just a whole lot more fun. <laughs> and any grandparent or great-grandparent will understand and agree with me on that premise at all. But when you go through a situation where the questions are, what are the legal rights? And this is when a child within state custody, you know, it makes you stop and think, what are the laws for someone just a normal situation where the child is not in custody? And the fact is, in Oklahoma, you can go through the law books and you won't find anything. You'll have what we call common law. It's kind of like what people think is the law, whether it really is the law or isn't the law. It's what people think the law is. But as soon as you have a conflict and an attorney for either party all of a sudden goes to the law books and says, well, let's see what the law is. They're going to search in vain because there is not in Oklahoma any really definitive description about the legal access of a grandparent to their own grandchild. So I think in Oklahoma and other states, we may start, we may see a process starting to see these procedures delineated. And again, because we have such a detailed set of circumstances, rules and regulations and administrative policies for children in state custody, look and learn what those are in your state first. Because something, not exactly the same, but something similar to that if you ask that that be worked towards within your state, then you'll have a less resistance because you're not doing something for the first time. You're basically trying to say, well, this is the way we do it for X number of children, you know, so many thousand children within the state in this calendar year or a specific year. Uh, but the first thing you need to do is, is do some research and figure out, well, how many, and you have to go to the census data for this, how many grandchildren are there in Oklahoma? I don't know. I haven't done that research. But when you, when you start a legislative process, you usually need to start with how big of a group are you dealing with here? Uh, oh, I see the message here. John Popop Schaefer is saying he likes what's going on. So oh, okay. <laughs> thank you for that feedback. Of course, you always like a little positive feedback as you go. Oh, and again, not only is this being broadcast live, but it, uh, after it concludes, it will be archived. It takes about 10 minutes after it's concluded before you can reaccess the videotape and watch it from scratch. So again, for the purpose of this discussion, it's going to be how can you specify what are the legal rights for a grandparent to visit their grandchild? First, you have to define grandparent. And again, it's not just the blood relationship, it's the legal relationship of a parent to child and their child. So it, it may sound like it's almost being argumentative. It may sound like you're trying to parse words too carefully and all, but you need to be prepared to give a legal definition 
for every major term within any proposed piece of legislation. What usually happens when you get to the full, by the time uh, legislation is drafted, there's staff members in every state and state legislature that actually end up doing the bulk of the drafting for legislative bills. When I was a staff member for elected member of a legislature and all, we'd start with the idea and we'd kind of sketch it up and we kind of like would write a 30 to 50 word description of what we wanted to see done and, and we'd list different terms. And the people that would draft the bill that were usually staff members with that state house or that state senate, they usually start by defining the terms. So they would say, this is a bill uh, specifically to, spe to delineate and clarify the visitation rights of a grandparent in Oklahoma to their own grandchildren. That would be what we call the caption of the bill, a, a general description. But the first thing they start doing is they start defining. They say, for the purposes of this legislation, a grandparent is defined as. And you might want to start with a description of how you define a grandparent. It may be easy when you know you're a grandparent to define, I'm a grandparent, but you have to come up with a set of words and description in legal language that would fit every possible circumstance that would be included and if you have any situations where you don't wish them to be included, you need to exclude those within your definition. You may want to say only grandparents by blood, co-sanguinity, which is a legal term. It's a blood relationship. You may want to include relationships beyond blood relationships, like in my case, a foster daughter who was I consider a granddaughter, so that her children are my great-grandchildren. But you might want to define that in your state to, to make sure that people understand what you're talking about. It's the old joke about, you know, what is art? Well, it's easy. You'll know it when you see it. But to define what is a grandparent is not as simple as it is on the surface. Stop and think of all the people in all the situations and all the circumstances and how many different combinations are there to their own, their own child's child, their own child's foster child, their own foster child's natural child, their own foster child's foster child. You can see how complex it can get, but you have to stop and begin by defining in legal terms what is a grandparent. And maybe we can get some help on the national level with the Grandparents' Rights Organization to come up with a more generic term a more generic de definition, a generic legal definition of what is a grandparent in our society. There are lots of national groups that help draft bills and legislation like that, and all this may be a good place for the national group to help come up with the definition. And whatever state codifies it in the language, in the legal language first, that would be a good model to use in any other state. Maybe it could be Oklahoma. Maybe it, maybe it won't be. But You'll never know until you try. So again, first you have to come up with the idea. And, and for the purpose of this discussion, the idea is define the legal access of a grandparent to their own grandchild. So once you define what relationships you want to include and what relationships you may not want to include, you have to stop and think about the process of getting it passed into law. Now this is where the little generic uh, social studies video comes in. I'm just the bill on Capitol Hill. It was meant to use the reference to the federal house and the federal Senate and all, but it applies in 49 of the 50 states in the fact that you have two legislative bodies and even in Nebraska where you have one legislative body. But that is that in every of the 49 states that have a house and a Senate or a lower house and an upper house using generic terms, they have committees. And every state has a different name for the different committees and all. There's no single name of committees that will apply in all, in all states. And it's really not up to, just because it looks like it may be more natural in one committee, when you get a list of all the committees of the Oklahoma House, you say, well, well this one sounds like where it should go, or maybe it could go on this one, because there's dozens of committees. And I can give you a list of the committees and read them over, and I could justify applying it to one, two, or three different committees and all. But when a bill first has to be conceived, then it has to be drafted, 
then it has to be introduced. Now, it wouldn't hurt between now and November 8th, the general election date, to talk to people who are running for Oklahoma House or Oklahoma Senate or running for the legislature in your state and start with find a candidate who's on the ballot in November who is also a grandparent. You always have to start with your strength. Find somebody who's already a grandparent and ask them about what's their personal idea about how, what kind of access should a grandparent have to their own grandchild in, in, the, in our state. And they'll kind of look at you and they'll either sort of just give you their own personal opinion and all. And if they give you an opinion that says that, yes, a grandparent, and the natural response is going to be, yes, a grandparent should have access, physical access to visit their own grandchild, you can stop and tell them, you can say, well, well guess what? That's really not clarified in law, but if and when you're elected, would you consider helping further along this process? And, of course, any candidate can ask you, well, what do you mean? You say, well, would you consider not just supporting, but maybe even introducing, because no piece of drafted legislation uh, can show up until at least one member of that legislative body decides to introduce that legislation. For example, in the Oklahoma House, one of the member, one of the 101 members, has to decide they want to support that, and it only takes one person, one member of that legislative body. They go down to the clerk of the House of Representatives and they file the bill and it's immediately assigned a number, like a House Bill 123, House Bill 124, 125, and they're given numerical sequence by the number it, they're introduced in. And it's also not at all unusual for a member to go down with a stack of three, four, or five different bills, uh, and if they really like a, n a number that's available to them, and there are even people who learn to get in line at a certain time because they they want to have number 100, or they want to have number 1,000, or they want to have number 500, or whatever. Or if they have four different bills, they'll decide what order they want their bills to be introduced so they get a certain number. Now, when you hear someone talk about HB 123, it's almost like a foreign language to most people because not everyone knows that HB 123 means House Bill 123 in the current legislative session of the legislature. But whatever number, and let's just use HB 123 as a hypothetical example to say that it was introduced and got that number. So when HB 123 is introduced, it's simply published, and it's what the legislators call being read for the first time. It doesn't mean it passes. It means that it's, it will show up in the records of the journal of the meetings of the Oklahoma House of Representatives as being a bill that's eligible to be heard doesn't mean that it will be heard. It means that it can be heard because it's been properly introduced. And once it's assigned a bill number and published and goes before the body, in this case the Oklahoma House of Representatives, and once it shows up in the printed journal and proceedings, that's a legal record and that's a legal notice to the public within Oklahoma that that bill is eligible to be considered. Not pa and, and can be baby passed, but it doesn't give any guarantee other than it's eligible. It's kind of like in baseball terms, it means that you get a uniform and you get to show up at the baseball game. <laughs> doesn't mean you get to play. It means you get to show up. Now let's say that you have a committee, uh, and let's just come up with a hypothetical name because you never really know exactly which committee it'll be given to. The presiding officer in each legislative chamber, in Oklahoma's case, the Speaker of the House, has the ability to assign, to assign any pending legislation to any committee that they deem it's appropriate to. Now, it's not at all unusual that sometimes you get bills assigned to areas that it seems like the content of the bill and the content of the committee don't really match, but that's really not up to the public to determine. It's up to the Speaker of the House in each respective state, and in some states they have separate rules and regulations where there's different ways that they get appointed to committees and all. But let's just use the Oklahoma example here. The Speaker of the House, in, in the other states I've worked in, it's the same thing. In the lower house, the Speaker of the House gets to refer the committee, gets to refer all pending legislation to whichever committee they want to. And in most cases, the, the journal will say, uh, you know, on this date was introduced HB 123, a bill proposing 
to clarify uh, the visitation rights of a grandparent to their own grandchildren and is assigned to the committee on, let's just say, social services. It's a hypothetical name, it's not an actual committee name, but it's an easier name to remember and it's, it's a name that kind of sounds big and generic uh, and probably there. Now, all the members of the committee are usually appointed within the first week of a legislative session. In Oklahoma, the people are sworn into office on Oklahoma Statehood Day, November 17th. Uh, but they have a one-day organizing session and they break until the month of February. <coughs> and the committee memberships are appointed. Now, committees can comprise from anywhere from on average from five to 15 or even as large as 20 members uh, of the 101 members of the Oklahoma House or whatever the, the uh, legislative size is in your state. Uh, for example, on the south side of the Red River here in Texas, the House is 150 members. And you can imagine that a lot of work has to be done in committees, just as with 101 House members in Oklahoma. It's really hard to, to function as a committee as a whole. You have to start at a lower level. Now let's, for purposes of discussion, just use the number 10 for the committee size. Uh, the person who introduces that bill may or may not be a member of that committee. It's helpful if they are. If the person who introduces the bill is on that committee, they probably have a much better chance of getting the chair of that committee to schedule it for a hearing. Now each committee takes, the, the committee chair gets to decide what bills assigned to their committee they get to hear each time they meet. And these have to be published with so many hours or days notice. And if you love to go online, you can always read the published list and the agenda of every committee of the Oklahoma House, the Oklahoma Senate, and who's going to meet with at least 24 hours notice, sometimes more. Uh, but it's not at all unusual sometimes to just get a couple hours notice that a bill is going to be put up for consideration. Now, if the person who proposed the bill is not on the committee, the first thing you need to do is find a member of that committee who likes what is being proposed. This is just what we call a good baseball strategy. It's not good to go in with a proposed piece of legislation and have the only person who supports that bill is the person sitting out in the audience who may or may not get a chance to present that legislation. Uh, but if a person on the committee is already receptive to it, in fact, it's always better to have two members of that committee that are already receptive because every committee you're going to have to have, if they go under strict rules of procedures, in most cases, it's like basic parliamentary procedure. You have to have someone move and someone second before it actually goes to a vote. So what will happen is let's say that a bill is presented within the first month of a session, the second month, the committee schedules it for a hearing. Uh, they have the hearing. Uh, it's posted. Members of the public are welcome to observe. And in many cases, members of the public are also eligible to speak. Uh, but there's also an old joke in politics is that if you don't have the votes to pass something before it's even called to order, you probably shouldn't have it scheduled on the agenda. So just because you're on the agenda, you might, as soon as you're posted or you know the committee chair will let you have something on the agenda, you might want to start to make your own little survey of the members of the committee to find out who's receptive. Now, it, most people on the committee are not going to tell you that, yes, I'll vote for it at committee, or no, I won't vote for it. Most of them are going to say, I'll, I'll take it under advisement, which is nice political legalese for I'll consider it, and I'm not going to say no. But it's kind of a hard thing to tell somebody face to face or over the phone or even by electronic message and all that you're not going to support their legislation. And again, if the proposal is for a grandparent to have physical visitation rights to their own grandchildren, to you and me, it might be what we consider a slam dunk. It's a natural. How can anyone be against that? Well, the reality is, is that there's thousands of proposals in front of these people. And just getting to the point to where a bill is, can, is scheduled is, a, is quite a hurdle. And just because you get scheduled and heard, it doesn't mean you're going to get more a one-minute hearing or a 30-minute hearing or even longer. It doesn't mean that you're going to have the opportunity for members of the public to testify in favor or against a piece of legislation. But let's deal with what usually happens. What usually happens is you'll know within a matter of a couple of days, or in best cases, within a week of when your bill is going to be considered. Well, you better start... First of all, someone needs to be surveying the members of the committee to find out 
what's the prospect for passage? And if more than half of the committee members are receptive to seeing this move forward, then you let it go to a hearing. You ask the person who's sponsoring it to go ahead and have it heard. If your first survey gets a lot of resistance or a lot of questions, or you just get a subjective feeling that you may or may not have the vote for it to pass at the first hearing, you might want to ask the sponsor of the bill to pass the first time it's eligible to be heard at committee so you can have it introduced one time, not heard, but it gives you a chance to have a better contact with the committee members between the time it's eligible to be heard, scheduled to be heard, and then it's actually heard. It's not at all unusual to have a bill scheduled for hearing and then passed. I mean, not heard. And it's usually because people aren't sure if they've got the votes there, or it may just simply be the time crunch of that particular meeting. Uh, if the meeting was scheduled on adjournment of a very hard, long legislative day, they met for 10 hours without a lunch break on the floor, all of a sudden the committee's called to order, they got 10 pieces of legislation, and yours isn't really urgent, just the fact that you didn't force it to be heard and let the more urgent pieces, they may only hear two of the 10 bills scheduled for being heard for that particular day if you have a really busy legislative day for that committee and all. So you've got to deal with the realities of what's happening and by the when you draft the bill, you don't know. But at some point, you're going to have a legislative committee in the House. In this case, we use a hypothetical name, the House Committee on Social Services. It's going to be called to order. The bill is on the list of bills that can be heard. And the committee chair can then call that bill as the next on the agenda. And they may or may not ask for testimony. Usually the sponsor of the bill, if physically present, gets the opportunity to present that bill first. And if any member of the committee wants to chime in, it's usually a good strategy to follow the, the sponsor of the bill to be physically present to make, the, to make the pitch to the committee that this is the bill and this is what they, it will do and this is what it will not do and this is where we think it will go. It's usually really good if you have at least one member, if not two members of the committee, that can kind of pick up the discussion as soon as it's finished there. Uh, or it's also good for them to be able to have some questions as soon as the proposed, as soon as the presentation is made. Uh, we just went dark on the screen. I don't know if that means we're off or. or I still see you. you still see. Okay. Uh, I think it may just simply be uh, this screen. Okay, this screen's back on it. Okay, uh, the screen I was working on uh, went dark from lack of uh, touching the tab here. So I'll just I'm back on. I don't think I was ever off, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. It, this particular uh, laptop here, it goes to sleep after uh, a certain <laughs> amount of time, and uh, right at a half hour, and that was right at a half hour. Wake it up once in a while. So again, uh, say we have the presentation from the, from a, a member of the state house of representatives who proposes the bill. Some members of the committee can offer questions to that person, and then members of the public can testify in favor or not in favor. And sometimes people can be on the bill. This is the neither for the bill or against the bill but they, are, they simply want to be on record uh, for purposes of communications of what happens after that. It's sort of a notification that they, they're kind of tracking the legislation. They're not supporting it. They're not opposing it, but they're tracking that legislation. So let's say in the best of all possible worlds that everyone who testifies from the public is in favor of the bill. It's not at all unusual for bills to be presented and everyone who speaks to be in favor of it, usually because the burden of opposing a piece of legislation and being physically present is usually a little harder than someone being in favor of something. So let's say that you make the presentation. The committee doesn't have to vote that same day, that same meeting on that bill, but it's not at all unusual that they do vote that same day. Again, it's sort of if you're meeting at 9 in the morning and the legis in the, that legislative chamber doesn't meet until 11 o'clock, it, it's not going to be as hard a pace is meeting and all, but if you're meeting at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., you can just feel the calendar. You can feel that you may want to, you may have this 20 minute presentation that's going to be cut down to two minutes, uh, but you don't know until you get there what's going to happen. Now, the rules haven't changed, but the circumstances in each and every case I'm giving you here do change. So, again, the rules don't change, the process doesn't change, but it's how you play the game. You have to decide for yourself, is, do you have a good receptive committee? 
And if you do, you have it brought up. You try to have it brought up, and if the, it is brought up, you bring it up in a positive way. You hope that all the speakers will be in favor. Don't worry if all the speakers are not in favor. If someone says they're against it because they don't think it's a good idea, or they think it's a good idea but it doesn't need to be part of law, or it needs to be part of law but this is the wrong section proposed to put it into, don't worry about that because that can always be cleared up at a later point and all. So don't expect every, everyone to support everything you think should be done just because you think it's a good idea. Again, you have to get a majority of that committee to go forward. Now, in the best of all possible worlds, every member of the committee will support it, but that doesn't always happen. In fact, it's actually fairly rare. Sometimes people will vote for or against a piece of legislation in a committee, not based on what the bill and proposal does, but by who proposed it. Now, political games do happen, and sometimes members of one political party will oppose a bill for no other reason than it's proposed by a member of another political party. So the best way to propose this is to make sure you get co-sponsors. Get a lead sponsor who should probably be a member of the political party that is the majority in that legislative chamber, and get a co-sponsor from the other political party. Uh, in most states, it's the Democratic Party, Republican Party, and whichever party has the majority in that legislative body, it would probably be politically best if they're the sponsor and the member of the other party is the co-sponsor of the bill. That way you show you have bipartisan support for making a definition and a change in the law. Again, it's just good politics. It's just a good way to approach things. So let's say that you had a nice receptive presentation before the House committee. The member uh, who was proposing it and the friend on the committee felt that yes, uh, they, we do think we had the votes on the committee to pass that. So the mem a member of the committee has to ask that it be passed by the committee and move forward in the process. Some committees require a second, some don't, and let's just assume like in parliamentary procedures that you have to have a motion and a second and a simple majority. Of the 10 members of the committee, you may only have six or seven members of the committee present. If 10 member committee only has seven people present and it passes four yes and three no, that still passes forward. But if you have a 10 member committee and only seven people present, you would probably want to get at least five or six yes votes to move it forward because even the members who aren't present want to feel that it has the level of support of a majority of the committee, whether the committee's all physically present or not. Again, just because it's a 10 member committee doesn't mean that all 10 members are there. For this example, let's say that only seven of the members are there and you've got five members that support and two members that have no position. It's okay to have a vote of five yes, zero no, and two present not voting. If you have a, a close number like five yes and four no, then that bill might be in trouble from the get-go. And just because you get a majority vote in committee and you pass the procedure to go from that committee to the next level doesn't mean it's going to go very far. The better you do at the committee level, if you get a unanimous or an overwhelming majority vote, the more likely it is that the bill is going to proceed to the next level. Now, in almost every state, you have what's called a calendars committee. It's a question, just because a bill passes a committee doesn't mean it automatically goes to the floor of that legislative chamber for a hearing, or I mean for a possible vote. It means that it's eligible to be listed there. Now, the problem is, is that there's thousands thousands, thousands of pieces of legislation introduced in every legislative session. Every bill doesn't get heard. Every bill that's heard doesn't get passed. Every bill that gets passed in committee doesn't get scheduled for hearing on the floor. But if the, com the calendars committee and your state legislative body wants to hear it, and in many cases the Speaker of the House whether they're officially a member or not a member of that committee, will have a lot to say about whether it gets scheduled. Uh, in many, many states, whether the majority member of the political party that has a majority in that legislative body is on the calendars committee or not on the calendar committee, if they want it on there, chances are pretty high that it will be on there. If they don't want it scheduled for hearing before the body, even if they're not a member of the calendars committee, 
the members of the calendars committee, he will be mostly made up of the political party that has a majority of the members in that body. Uh, it won't get heard. So don't be surprised just because you do a quick survey and a calendars committee of, say, five members, all five people say, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it. They may personally support it, but it doesn't mean as a member of the calendars committee they're going to vote to have it scheduled. But let's say in this case the Speaker of the House likes your proposed legislation and the Chair of the Calendars Committee likes your proposed legislation, then it's your responsibility, not theirs, not the legislative bodies, but it's your responsibility as the people proposing this legislative change to qu quickly survey the other members of the Calendars Committee, and then you need to demonstrate to the Chair of the Calendars Committee that you've got three out of five members that want the bill to go forward. In a better, all in a perfect world, which we don't live in, you can say every member of the Calendars Committee wants it to go forward, and the Speaker of the House likes it also. It's kind of a little like icing on the cake. Even though the Speaker may or may not be a member of that committee and you're in that body, uh, they, they can personally keep a bill off the floor of the House and not be put forward past the Calendars Committee. But let's say in this case it goes forward. It gets scheduled for a hearing on the floor of the Oklahoma House of Representatives or the lower chamber of whichever state you're in. Then, as we say, the games can begin. Another member of the committee may like the general direction of what you're trying to do, but they think the language needs to be, be, be clarified. So they may amend it on the floor. They will propose amendments that may or may not be considered on the floor. And again, the person, the sponsor of the legislation, in many cases, gets the ability to whether to receive it. It's kind of like when parliamentary procedures you call a friendly amendment or an unfriendly amendment, terms you will never see in Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, but terms, terminology that a lot of people use. If the amendment is, a, is what we would call friendly, it's really trying to help perfect or improve the legislation. A lot of times these will go from the person who proposes the amendment to the sponsor before the session's held. And whoever's presiding in the legislative chamber will call on the sponsor of the First Amendment, say Amendment Number 1 by Adams, and they'll present the uh, legislation. And the sponsor of the legislation, rather than put it to a vote, will simply accept the amendment. Uh, and even if they don't like everything in their proposed amendment, if they think it's going to help move things forward, people will accept the amendment whether they agree with everything in the amendment or not. The goal here is to get more than half of the votes to pass by a simple majority on the floor of the Oklahoma House. In a 101-member House, the Speaker is usually present not voting. It means that you need to get 50, at least 50 to 49, or in this case, 51 to, 51 to 49, 51 to 48, because the Speaker is usually present not voting. So it's not the sponsor's <coughs> job to go out and survey all the other members of the legislature. This is why you hear people in, referred to as lobbyists. Grandparents' Rights of Oklahoma <coughs> and other groups and volunteers need to quickly survey their legislative members to find out, and not as, it, it, the question isn't, will you definitely vote yes if this goes to the floor for a vote? But are you receptive to supporting this legislation? And if they are receptive, then you can go to the second step and say, well, if proposed, next week on a specific date, specific time, would you vote yes? You need to survey the legislative members to make sure you can demonstrate to the sponsor that it's likely to pass in that legislative chamber. And of 101 members, you may have to have 100, you have a sponsor, so you still got 100 more contacts to make to figure out how these are going to be done. Now, in many cases, you can go around in the Capitol building itself and you're not going to be able to talk to every legislative member in person, but a lot of time you'll be able to talk to the legislative aide, the staff member, and you can say, hi, my name is Mike Workman. I'm a volunteer with Grandparents' Rights of Oklahoma. Uh, we have House Bill 123, which is to clarify the visitation rights of grandparents to their own grandchildren. It's up for a vote <laughs> here uh, and given a specific date, like two days away. Uh, do you know if your member... Is, is on record to support this legislation or not. Uh, and if they know, they'll tell you. If they don't know, they'll say, well, let me check with the, with the member, the member of the House of Representatives, and get back to you. 
So they may give you a phone call, they may send you an email, they may get too busy and never get around to connect to contacting the member to get that feedback. It depends on where you are in the legislative calendar. If you're at a quiet time of the session uh, and you're dealing in the first month of a several month session, the pace is a lot more relaxed. If you've only got three days before the legislature has to adjourn, it's a crunch and you're going to have a really hard time getting this type of communication out. But it's not the job of the sponsor to survey the members of their own chamber and get that vote. It's the job of the proposed body, the people who bring forward the legislation to survey and demonstrate that you have a good chance, nothing certain, nothing certain except death and taxes, but if you get the bill for a vote on the floor, you think you have a good chance of getting a majority vote so it can go forward. Again, the higher the majority, the higher the number, the better chance you have of it getting further along. Now, if you pass one chamber, in this example, the Oklahoma House of Representatives, the job isn't even half over yet. You get to start all over in the other chamber. Now, it doesn't mean you have to wait until you pass the Oklahoma House before you start. You can start, in fact, it's best, you better have this bill filed in both the lower chamber and the upper chamber before you even start. But for the purpose of this example, we simply use the House as where it got to a floor vote first, and you got a, a floor vote where it did pass and go forward. And the reason I say it's not even half is just because you pass the House and Senate doesn't mean it's going to get signed by the governor or the executive in your state. But that's, that's another part of the discussion. So let's say before you get to a floor vote in the House, you've already started over in the Senate. You found a sponsor of the majority party in the Senate and a co-sponsor of the party that not in the, of, in the minority in the state Senate to support your proposed legislation. It's been drafted. It's HB 123, but it starts all over from scratch over in the Senate side. They can file the exact same language, the exact same words as you proposed in the House, but it may get a different number. In fact, it's going to get a different number. It's going to be filed in a different system. So the senator goes down with their proposed legislation they wish to file, and they get a number. And let's use, for example, here, they get number 321. And I use the numbers in reverse and all because when you go to the Senate, you don't talk any longer about HB 123 because that's not a House bill in the Senate. It's a Senate bill in the Senate, and the numbers are going to be different. So when you're talking to a House member, talk in terms of the House number. When you're talking to a Senate member, talk in terms by the Senate number. And it gets confusing because a lot of times people will use the shorthand. I'll talk about HB 123, and they're talking to a senator. But the senator knows what you're talking about, but they may or may not. In this case, let's say the number got assigned Senate Bill 321. So now you have to start over and do the same process in the Senate. The presiding officer uh, of the Senate, when it's, hurt, when it's given a number, it goes to the floor of the Senate, it's published in the Senate Journal, and it's assigned to committee by the, by the President Pro Tem or whoever the Senate wants to be assigning committees at that time. And the process starts all over. It's not at all unusual, and, and it, the best way to have it is where one chamber meets in one month and then two or three weeks later. And if, if you have it closer than that, it's really hard to gather your supporters to be there to have it like back to back. You don't ever want to have it on the same day or in the same week. It's usually better if you have it go in one chamber in one week, and it usually takes two or three weeks before you want it heard in the other chamber, because sometimes it'll take that long for you to get together your supporters. But let's say that in the first month of a legislative session, it got introduced and heard in the House committee, and the second month it gets heard in a Senate committee, and in both cases it goes forward, and let's say in the third month it gets passed on the floor of the House, and now later that month or the next month it gets brought forward, and the same process goes over in the Senate. The Senate Calendars Committee decides whether they want it scheduled for vote or not scheduled for vote. Just because you get out of committee doesn't mean you get to the floor of that legislative chamber. It's a whole separate step. And again, just because you know what the rules are and you know what the procedure is doesn't mean that it's going to be implemented because somebody has to be there to promote that each and every step of the way. Well, let's say that you successfully got through Senate sponsor, Senate committee appointment, 
Senate committee hearing or passage. And it may be that you've got such a good bill and such a good proposal that when it's scheduled for hearing, that they simply bring the bill up and say, well, this is such an easy one here. We don't really need to have a hearing for it. Let's just go ahead and pass it without a hearing. Doesn't happen very often, but it might happen. It could happen, but don't count on it happening. Be prepared for it to go the full, full length of a proposal, the Senate sponsor proposing it in person to the Senate committee hearing, having people from the public speak in favor of it. That's your job as supporters to make sure that several people, not just one or two people, are there to speak in favor of the proposed legislation. And don't be surprised and don't be panicky if somebody shows up and speaks against it. Again, they might speak against it because they like the idea, but they don't like the wording, or they think it's a, a good wording, but they don't like the bill, the, po the point in law that is proposed to change. Don't let that sidetrack you. Try to move forward and say that we'll try to work that out later. Now, again, you go to the floor of the Senate, and you may or may not have amendments on the floor of the Senate, which may or may not be the same as what you heard over in the House. Now, the chances of, of HB 123 and SB 321 being word for word the same are not very good. Just because it started with exactly the same language, word for word, as HB 123 and SB 321, it may have gotten changed at the committee level if they change as much as a semicolon to a colon, if they change as much as a comma to a dash, any word, any punctuation change, if there's any difference whatsoever, what passes the House and what passes the Senate, if it's not exactly the same, every word, every space, every punctuation mark, it legally and technically is not the same bill. But it's not at all unusual to have one set of amendments that come up through like a House committee and on the House floor, and another set of amendments or clarifications that come up through the Senate committee or on the floor of the Senate. It passes in a very similar fashion, and you look at it, and you know that more than 90% of what's in the House version and the Senate version are the same. Then it goes to, it has the possibility, it's not required, but it has the possibility of going to what's called a conference committee. The presiding officer in both chambers have the ability to appoint a conference committee. It usually, but doesn't always include the sponsors of the legislation, and it usually it makes a special point of including members of both political parties, and if you have a controversial bill, it'll even include an opponent of the legislation on the conference committee. Now, let's say there are no active opponents, and you get, say, five House members and five Senate members, and the sponsor in, the, in both chambers are on the committee, these 10 members have the ability to work out any differences in the language. Now, the reality is, is those 10 people don't get into a room and sit down at one time at one place. A lot of times, the House sponsor and the Senate sponsor will get together and come up with a proposal where every word, every space, every punctuation mark is worked out so the exact same language is there. And the House sponsors will go to the House conferees and say, this is what I want. What can I get your support? And the Senate sponsor will go to the Senate conferees and do the same thing. And all they have to do is tell the chair of the conference committee, who may or may not be the sponsor of the legislation, that the conferees, the House conferees support the revised version, and on the Senate conferees support the, sen the revised version, and the revised version is the same in both chambers, then even though all 10 members, in this case, hypothetically, of the conference committee never physically get together, the chair of the conference, the chairs of the conference committee from the Senate and the House publicly go on record saying that we have support or it passes. That never even having a physical meeting, it's simply done by telephone or by word of mouth or inter interpersonal communication, which may be face-to-face, some of it may be by telephone, some of it may be phone calls, some of it may be a text message, who knows. The communication is not important here, but the, if the chair of the conferees and the House and Senate come to an agreement, they can proceed to go. And then again, both chambers have to have a vote. It goes back before the conference the calendars committee. The Senate calendars committee has to go to a floor vote. At this point, it's usually a formality. Usually you will have a long list of several dozen, if not a hundred bills, 
that the conferees bring forward and the Senate usually gets to concur and it's usually a matter of unanimous consent. If you're ever sitting up in the gallery of, this, uh, of the House or Senate in any state <coughs> legislative chamber, you'll hear a lot of very fast language. Uh, people jokingly say that a skill as an auctioneer would really be in handy here because you'll hear something to the effect of <coughs> House will not consider HB 121 of this House Committee conferees. The House conferees are all in consent. House, the House conferee chair Bruce proposal in hearing, uh, we're asking for unanimous consent and hearing no objections passed. And all of a sudden you hear a gavel. It sounds like an auctioneer, and in 10 to 15 seconds, your revised bill just passed. And it goes by in a heartbeat. And it's sometimes really startling to people who've never watched or seen it before. But if you sit there day in and day out, particularly later in the legislative session, you'll hear a lot of language going, and it really almost sounds like an auctioneer. Now, you've passed the same bill in your lower house and your upper house, and your job's not over. Because that bill will likely need a signature of the chief executive in your state, most likely the governor in your state. If you don't already have not the support of your governor, but at least an indication that the governor will not oppose your bill, you haven't done your job and you're probably not going to get passed by the House of Senate because there's nothing that legislators hate worse than to go through all the process of passing a bill, passing a conference, getting a conference committee, having a conference committee work out the differences between the two chambers, and then have the governor not support a bill. And either it fails by lack of signature or worse yet, the governor actually vetoes your legislation. And the legislatures don't like having to be asked to override a veto of a governor. And on, it's just going to take a pretty, pretty major piece of legislation. And as much as grandparents' visitation to their own grandchildren may be very important to you and to me and a lot of other people, it's not going to rise to the point if a governor doesn't want it to happen, it doesn't matter if the House and Senate pass it and want it to go, it's not going to get signed. But the governor might not want to veto or allow something not to pass for failure to be signed in their state for something like this. But you have to have somebody that will already go and talk to a staff member in the governor's office to let them know what's coming to the governor's desk. Let's say you've already done this homework. A staff member in the governor's office has already indicated to you that if you get passed through the legislature, the governor will sign your legislation. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but the chances are much better. Again, just because you know how the game's supposed to be played and the way it actually happens, uh, you want to make sure you actually get those commitments followed up on. So let's say you got it passed through the Senate, you got it passed through the House, the governor's agreed to sign it, they're going to have a nice little bill signing <laughs> ceremony, usually in the blue room, which is a nice room for bill signing, or they might even want it signed on the floor or in the rot of the House or in one of the committee rooms, it depends on how many people you want there. And it's not at all unusual to have the sponsors of the, in the House and the sponsor in the Senate, the co-sponsors and some of the leading supporters in both legislative chambers, and some of the community members, like members of the Grandparents' Rights of Oklahoma, who went so far as to help get this bill from concept to signed piece of legislation to be present at the bill signing ceremony. And that bill signing ceremony sometimes can happen weeks after the legal signature has actually happened. It's, usually, it's a ceremony. It may or may not be the actual bill signing. On the federal level, you see a lot of time a president will sit down and use 15 different pens. They'll use a different pen for every letter in their name and all, and they give the pens out for ceremonies. And usually it doesn't happen on the state level at all. The governor will reach over, grab a pen, sign it. They may use two or three pens. Uh, one of my favorite parts is where they sign it with one pen. They pick up four other pens, they put that pen there, they roll it around their hands, and so you can't tell which pen actually signed it. And then they give, as souvenirs, the pens to the House sponsor, to the Senate sponsor, and then to the uh, other members of the public who helped bring that bill forward and all. And, and a lot of people like to take the final sign, a copy of, this, of the official bill when it appears and have it framed with that pen in the frame and all. So if you ever go to a lobbyist or an organization's office, look for pieces of signed legislation on their wall, and if you see a pen in the frame with it, you'll know that they had a good bill signing ceremony, and they got one of the pens, which means they had more than just probably a casual role in getting this done. So I hope that uh, 
this time will help you. It, it, again, it's kind of using a uh, the Will Rogers example of this, that those of weak stomachs should never watch laws nor sausages being made. Just because you understand the way the rule book is written and the way the game is supposed to be played, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of human nature that goes into every step of the way. Again, it helps if you start with a good idea, like defining the grandparents' visitation rights of their own grandchildren. You get it drafted. You get it put into the legal language that's not going to be opposed by a lot of people. You get a sponsor in both legislative chambers. You get a fair hearing. You go past the hearing. You get past the calendars committee in both chambers. You get a positive vote in both chambers, and you get a, a positive support and a signature from the executive, usually the governor, in your state. And then you have changed the law. You haven't changed people's behavior, but you've changed the law so that if and when a conflict ever happens, people can go to the law and say, well, here's what the law says. But a lot of times, these are not problems. It's very rare that you have problems with grandparents having visitation rights to their own grandchildren. But you and I know it does happen. And if and when it does happen, you need to know what the law is. And right now, the law is, well, we don't have a law that deals with that. <laughs> so, well, if they have a law, does that help? Yeah, or, or if they do have a law. Again, it would help to know what are the existing processes for people who are in state custody, and you might have the people who draft the legislation use that as a model, because the closer you are to that, the better. The lower the cost to administer that law, the better. You don't want to have a procedure where you have to have the equivalent of a DHS caseworker physically present that transports the child to a neutral site. You're given a set number of hours, of minutes, or time that you can visit. And this does happen, and it's very common, and it needs to happen for children in state custody now because we're dealing with very fragile situations. And a lot of times you have situations where the grandparent uh, and the grandchild have, are fine with each other, or they may not be, but it's the person in between where the conflict is actually occurring. And that's why it wouldn't hurt to have the law more clearly specified so that in Oklahoma or any other state, we would know what is the law in your state that guarantees the physical access for a grandparent to visit their grandchild. So let's see if there's any questions here. Uh, looking at the clock, I've taken the full hour and didn't expect to take that much time, but if there's any questions, I think you have an opportunity to respond. We have uh, Teresa Hendricks Faber, Farber, not sure, is on. Uh, John Pop Pop Schaefer, Charlotte Bradford, and I know. She's on. Charlotte, I have a question. We have a question. So we do. We don't actually write the bill. We give it to a member of the legislature to write. Well, it depends on how much uh, resources you have. Uh, because we're dealing here with a group that doesn't have uh, professional staff, you might want to start with just kind of drafting the concept, finding a legislator uh, in both the Oklahoma House and Senate who is receptive to that legislation and having them take it for the actual drafting to be done by the staff members in the Oklahoma House and the Oklahoma Senate. Uh, you don't have to actually draft the legal version of it. It's not at all unusual for people to come in with completely drafted pieces of legislation. But these are people who do legislation as a matter of routine. These are people who have organizations that have staff, that have staff with offices, with offices in their state capitol buildings. The Grandparents Rights Association of Oklahoma and any other state that I know of doesn't have that. I don't even think on the national level there's any uh, staff or office at this point. So you're dealing with volunteers on the state level and the national level. But as soon as this starts to move forward in Oklahoma or any other state, you can have sample language. It's not at all unusual that if it passes in one state that you say, well, this is what Virginia did, or this is what Nebraska did, or this is what Massachusetts did. Uh, it doesn't matter what another state did. Each and every state can and will have their own version of what they want to define uh, visitation rights of grandparents to their own grandchildren. They may have a different definition of what's a grandparent. But again, every state can and will define their laws for their states. Mm -hmm. well, any, other, you, any other questions? We have a couple other people present. I think they're here for moral support as much as anything. <laughs> I, 
Uh, again, I'm Mike Workman of Tulsa, grandparent, great-grandparent, and I will be a person who will voluntarily help this effort along. Uh, and I see I if we... Uh, <laughs> and, and thank you to Bobby Anderson for joining us here. <laughs> All right. Goodbye for now. Signing out. One way might be just...